It is working. We'll be live in just a second. Okay, we're live. Great. Good afternoon and welcome to the Land Use and Ethics Subcommittee hearing. Sorry about the delay. Um, so today we are gonna go through these bills team um, that you see on your screen and we'll take this down in a second so that we can all see each other better. Um, but feel free to take a look. I know there are a couple folks still going on. Um, so we're gonna take one of these out of order and then we'll go through the rest in, um, in order. <laughs> so the one I'd like to take out of order is HB 80. Um, HB 80 is Delegate Charcutian's bill regarding tree replacement uh, for Purple Line, uh, uh, for basically for communities that are along the Purple Line corridor to have some sort of program to help replace and plant trees. So we, it had a huge fiscal note, <laughs> as you might remember, and so we put off uh, we've delayed, uh, you know, having any decision on it, hopeful that we could work with the, uh, with Delegate Charcutian and with the department to bring the fiscal note down. Um, they think they have done that and they are working on amendments. Uh, I don't know, uh, Matt, I think, ha Matt, did you get the, did I give you or Patrick, one of you, I can't remember. Me, me. You have it, the copy of the amendment, sorry. Um, I just got them, yeah. You just got them. So, We'll share those with everybody. It basically creates an urban tree grant program through MDOT, um, but we wanna make sure as well that it's actually going to the source of the problem. So we'll share that with everybody, but we do believe that it will bring the fiscal note down significantly and perhaps all the way <laughs> to the point where it will just be existing resources will be used to cover it so it won't cost um, almost anything. Um, but I didn't, I, I, it's been sitting there for a little while, so I don't want people to think that we've forgotten about it. We are working on it and we're just waiting for, the amendments came in this morning. So we, and they were drafted by MDOT. So we have to get them put into, you know, official amendment language and then we'll bring that bill back. Hopefully we'll be able to, um, you know, vote on it next Tuesday. Um, so that's the one that I wanted to pull out of order just to update folks. Any questions? I know you haven't seen the amendments, um, but any questions on that? I just I have one question, uh, sure. Brooke. Um, this uh, Danish bill uh, with the ability to plant all the trees and stuff that in that bill that he had. Yeah. Um, if for some reason you ended, if his bill gets through, then some of that money from there, the Bay Restoration Fund, could be used to plant these trees. It's true. Yeah, I mean that's a good point. Maybe some of the Bay. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it might be worth talking to Delegate Stein about, you know, ensuring that MDOT could perhaps receive some of that money um, to fund tree plantings in the corridor, in these corridors. Yeah. Either that or you use MDOT's money and uh, then get Dana, using Dana's bill, supplement it some more to do an even better job. Yeah, no, it's a good idea. More trees, never a bad thing. <laughs> Um, thank you for that. Yep. No, it's a good idea. Okay. Um, great. Well, let's go back to the start of our committee, our meeting agenda then and start with, um, HB 63. Uh, we heard this last Friday. We heard most, we heard a bunch of these bills last Friday. Um, this is the bill on prohibiting appropriations for the maglev. Um, Patrick, can you give us just a couple of sentences about it? Well, that's pretty much it. Except it. For, yeah. It's, well, it's important to note that it's um, it's prohibiting the use of an appropriation, which is a play on words because you can't we can't in statute prohibit an appropriation, ah. but it's prohibiting any department from using the appropriation. I would point out that any appropriation that is given by any governor can be stricken by the general assembly when it comes. So even if this didn't pass, then we could strip a maglev appropriation right you know, really standardly right and soon we'll have the ability to do more than that <laughs> in the budget um okay yes I'm not, I'm not sure why you would want to do this i mean even if you don't like the maglev uh, program i mean it sets a little bit of a precedent plus you know that maglev program has got to be a few years away who knows <laughs> what it might evolve into 
I mean, could be that the communities would change their mind. I don't know why they wouldn't want to put something like this in law. Thanks. Any other thoughts, Delegate Trump? Yeah, I mean, I thought the issue was that they were saying they didn't need any appropriations from the state. So this was sort of codifying what they've said. So now we're going to put in the law what people say. <laughs> and and that, that fills into the next bill down the road in here. I was going to say, we have another bill that's about codifying what somebody has said. <laughs> we'll right. use that what shortly. Do you, what do you think I well, said that there's, for? I mean, like, I think there's a reason for that. I think, like, otherwise you just sort of have <laughs> institutional knowledge, just have to have people say, oh, yeah, I remember they said this. But if that's what they're saying now, I mean, I had this experience for 12 years on the county council. Like, you had to remember 12 years ago, well, wait a minute, didn't they say X, Y, Z? So I think if they're saying they're not going to spend the money, mm -hmm. they don't need state money, then I personally like the idea of codifying them. I, mean, I, I think it's a uh, people always people can go back on their word. It's weird. Like people always say yeah. they don't do and they don't do it. And, you know, I mm -hmm. think my opinion of it all is just that you know, I think <clears throat> if we're going to spend state money on transportation, it needs to be more linked towards uh, improving the transportation options and equitable transportation options within the city, within Baltimore City, because I know this is going to be in Baltimore and then across the across the state. And I think. Um, in my opinion, it's based on the testimony, based on my understanding of Matt it's going to be more of a, a pitch it as a thing that will benefit the state of Maryland and will be able to commute from Baltimore to DC faster. To me, it's more of a getting from DC to New York faster thing. That's what it's more so about. And if it's going from DC to New York, the biggest beneficiary isn't the state of Maryland. Um, so why, you know, I think it's, it's a good idea to go ahead and codify it. Um, I mean, it's just to make sure they can't go back on their word once they, because you know what, you know what's going to happen is they, they get halfway through it and like, oh, actually, we need some state money to finish this. You know. Elliot Weibel. Yeah, I one of, I think one of the comments made by one of the folks who gave testimony is that is the message that it sends. I mean, uh, from our area, Maryland already has a pretty uh, bad reputation as far as being business friendly, and this just kind of fires a shot across the bow, saying, you know. Even if there is or ne is or never is any state money involved, it it just kind of sends that message that you're not Thank welcome you. in Maryland. Thank you. Um, so let's let's hold it. I mean, we're not. I you know these are this is the first time we're discussing any of these, so I want to hold all of them um, and just make sure that we're talking and talking them through. Um, so let's hold it for now. Um, you know, we can folks can talk with the sponsor and look at. Yeah. You know, this is just on Friday, so we can look at the um, testimony, but this is helpful. Could I make one more comment on that? Of course. Yeah. Uh, you should always be joyful when you get what you want, but you better make sure that it ain't going to come back and bite you later. Mm -hmm. And this could have this could have a reverse effect on on the uh, on the uh, folks that are asking for it at some point in time on something else. I mean, that means if Maglev's involved in any transportation uh, in Prince George County, Anne Arundel, Baltimore County City, anything like that, that they can't get any state funding. Things change. Uh, you know, I, I think when you lock yourself in, you're making a bad mistake. Okay. Um, good, good discussion. Um, so the next bill is HB 67. This is Delegate Corman's Promises Act. Uh, this was a bill that we, that's why I said, speaking of promises that we're codifying, <laughs> um, this is the bill that would codify many of the promises made to Montgomery County and Prince George's County communities over the last few years by the Secretary of Transportation and by the governor regarding um, the 495-270 massive, huge P3 project. Delegate Love. Thank you, Madam Chair. I know we passed this bill last year. Um, we is did. this in the same posture as the one we passed last year? I believe there'll be if there are some changes and maybe some amendments coming. Does Patrick, do Patrick or Matt have this? Sorry. I have this. Okay. Um, there are some, some changes. Um, they're not huge. 
Um, one is that it prohibits Board of Public Works um, from approving projects unless it meets the requirements of the bill. Um, and it prohibits the board from approving additional funds for the P P3 program after 2021. And it also makes it an emergency bill. Now, as to the potential coming amendments, um, Chairman Learman was referring to the sponsor talking about other statements that the um, Secretary Slater has made um, since then. And I don't know, do you wanna continue to have a rolling bill with rolling amendments every time Secretary Slater mentions something? Um, well, after we pass it, we won't, I mean, you know, if we were to pass this, it would codify those promises and a new bill would have to come in with, you know. Well, I think that's kind of my point is that you just yeah. wait for a new bill if that's the process that we're going to take. Yeah. Well, let's wait and see what the, I have not seen the sponsors amendments. I don't think they've come in yet. So let's, um, we'll see what those are. Do folks remember this bill from last year though? Okay, great. Can I, can, can I ask about an amendment? Sure. And I'm kind of, kind of playing the devil's advocate here. I'm sure. Uh, uh, past governors and past secretaries of transportation have made promises to the communities in Southern Maryland to build a new Thomas Johnson Bridge. So should I amend this bill to say they have to do that too? You could bring a bill, Delegate Clark, requiring uh, to I want to require to that is. I don't think it would actually qualify. It's a different subject. There's a single subject rule. Um, so this is about a P3 project in Montgomery and Prince George's County. So I think that you would need to bring a bill to require the state to rebuild the Thomas Johnson Bridge, which is maybe, a bridge and maybe, should be rebuilt. Maybe we've been talking about making it a P3. You could still, I'm, it's still, I still think it would not pass the single subject test rule, but you know, we can, uh, I think it's a great bill for you to bring. <laughs> well, I, I think that- In an election year. <laughs> yeah, I think all governors and all um, secretaries of transportation and all department heads make promises that never come true. So, you know, I mean, what are we really doing? I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's, yeah, I, I don't know. To, to me, it's just kind of frivolous legislation. Okay. Nope, understood. Understood. Um, but thank you. Okay, HB 485. This is Delegate Solomon's bill. This is this is not specifically about 495 and 270, the big P3. This is about the P3 process overall. Um, you know, many of you may remember from last year. We had a lot of testimony. Um, then Lieutenant Governor Brown and uh, had a commission creating a P3 process. I think now that we've like sort of lived and learned a little bit about how these large P3s work and seen and we've seen them in action. Uh, you know, last year we decided that we learned a lot, and so we needed to update and amend the P3 process to provide more, you know, more opportunities for oversight by the General Assembly for these hugely expensive and um, long-term projects. Um, I don't know, uh, sorry, Matt, is this yours? Okay, yes. Sure does. I knew one, of a, one of the P3 bills was. Um, you wanna talk at all? I know there were some amendments to, to take the BMC and WashCog out, for instance. Um, do you wanna talk about, could you refresh people's memory of the, this bill? Sure. Uh, so just generally, um, as Delegate Lehman noted, the bill establishes a P3 Oversight Review Board, alters the review and approval process for P3s valued in excess of $500 million, and expands requirements for all P3 agreements. Um, as mentioned, there were amendments. You should have received an email in advance of the hearing. Uh, one of those amendments was to remove the participation of the Baltimore Metropolitan Council and the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments uh, from their roles in the bill. Uh, there was some concern that there might be a violation of federal law if they were to act outside of their metropolitan planning area to analyze projects that, that for, say for the Baltimore Metropolitan Council that would take place in Southern Maryland or around the DC area. There was also a very recent amendment by Delegate Solomon um, specific to the treasurer's office and that is on page six of the bill. 
Um, and I'm still working with the treasurer's office to confirm the exact language, but generally, um, and I, I could share my screen if that helps. Sure. Okay. Uh, Danny, can you share a screen? Let me just make sure. Yep, give me one document. second. Right. Okay. Can everybody see it now? Yep. We, we good? Okay. So this amendment would uh, strike language as to credit rating agencies uh, performing an assessment, an independent assessment of the impact of a P3 on the state's credit rating, or sorry, each contract under the P3 agreement, and would require the financial advisor that is performing the risk analysis to do that uh, review. Um, and so what we're still trying to work out is what how this language should tie in with the other language. I think ultimately it would read a financial advisor chosen by the state treasurer's office uh, or what I've uh, what I've written here. I'm just going back and forth with the treasurer's office to determine if this is consistent with the request that they put through uh, and that delegate Solomon had offered. Right, okay, that's pretty technical. I mean, it, it's meaningful, but it's um, yeah. not in the word, not in the way the DLS often uses it. <laughs> technical and that it's very detailed. Okay. A question, is there a specific reason why they chosen by the state treasurer and not necessarily chosen by the Board of Public Works? Uh, well, the, the it would be the same firm that's providing the risk analysis when that language is currently in the bill as reintroduced. Um, so it would just be the same firm doing both the review of the credit rating and the risk analysis. Okay. Um, and that was because there was some concern that the credit rating bureaus might not be able to provide this uh, analysis as it was requested in the bill as introduced, but that the, that the financial advisors would be able to provide this review. Okay. That's yeah. important. Okay. That's important. Okay. Um, any other questions right now? We, we will we'll continue to look at this throughout the week and we can talk more about it either next week or the following week. Okay. Um, now let's move to HB 510, um, Delegate Valentino Smith's bill on creating a private sector transportation projects ombudsman. Um, we had this bill last year, I believe. And what did we do with this bill last year, Patrick? Killed it. Killed it. We, killed, we moved it unfavorable, right. Um, and my understanding from the fiscal note is that this already exists. Yeah, MDOT's testimony gives the name and contact information for the ombudsman. Okay. Um, any questions about this bill right now? We'll just hold it, but delegate trust. There's already an ombudsman that's a government employee. So yes, this this bill would mandate creation of a ombudsman of an ombudsman at MDOT to deal with private sector projects, and that position that person already exists at MDOT is my is my understanding. Didn't always exist, but does exist now. As of what did they say? As of when? I didn't think. As of last year, I didn't think they did. Last year, there was, I, my memory is that we didn't pass it because this, this person existed. Um, but maybe, I don't know, Patrick, do you remember? That's, that, that's my memory too. And correct myself um, that we, we took no action on this bill last year. Okay. But yes, yeah, so that, that's my memory too, Delegate. Yeah, we didn't feel the need to pass it because it already existed. Um, I think, you know, the delegates, the sponsors' argument would be, of course, that MDOT could you know, change their mind and not have this person in the future. Um, but it's a, uh, it's already there <laughs> right now, at least. So that's good. I mean, at least there's somebody there. Um, there's a person whose position, is there somebody who you can call about these issues or there's a person who serves as an ombudsman? There's a, I don't understand the difference. There is a person who is an ombudsman who you can call about this issue is what MDOT said. They, they gave their name and contact information in their testimony. Right. I guess my question is, is there somebody who that's their job or is somebody who 
for various projects, here's the contact person on this project. I don't know that it's a full-time job is the issue. I mean, I remember last, I think last year we had this discussion about whether there's a, I mean, somebody could be, have other jobs and also be the ombudsman for these types of projects. I don't know that um, MDOT thought it was a full-time job, but we can, but maybe they do and we could, so I'm not sure is the answer. I, we can bring MDOT yeah. on to answer these questions. They said, they said for questions regarding either of the aforementioned projects, which is um, maglev and hyperloop or any that might arise in the future this woman is available who is it um, her name is lisa webb okay I, yeah. this is Can only I, for on. private sector transportation projects don't forget so that's why they're only referring to two projects okay right. okay uh, if it would be helpful we can bring mdot on next week too to answer more questions about that Okay, that might be helpful. Thank you, Charles. Delegate Holmes. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And that's uh, what you're discussing now is, in fact, what Geraldine's uh, concern is going to be raised about uh, what I think she wants. Uh, it's just what uh, Jen has been saying, uh, Delegate Trost has been saying. Yeah. What uh, Delegate uh, Geraldine and Valentine Smith want is a specific department, a specific person, that kind of thing. Uh, just, you know, because I've had, because she's in the same district that I'm in, I've had multiple conversations with her. And um, so this is what her desire is. So maybe perhaps we need additional conversation with the secretary or something. Yep, I think that makes sense. It looks like Lisa Webb's title is manager P3 and innovative project delivery. Um, so. And assigned to other stuff later. Right. As we yeah. recall last year, and then there would be a vacancy there from a specific person identified for this kind of thing. So, right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, let's, I mean, we're going to hold it like the other bills. We can, we can go back and talk to Dele Delegate Valentino Smith and, and have MDOT come on as well to answer questions. Um, great. Thank you. Um, and last but not least in any way, um, we have three bills from Delegate Ivy. Um, one was presented on Thursday and two were presented on Friday. There's 703, 704, and 705, which I'm impressed he, he got that in, in that order because I have never managed to get my bills in numerical order like that. So um, it's awesome <laughs> um, and handy, it makes it easier to remember. Um, so these are you know important bills on transportation projects. Um, some, uh, two of them have to do with the P3 and one has to do with the maglev. Um, so perhaps we could take the 703 and 705 first to discuss. Those are bills that have to do with the P3 project. Um, Patrick, do you want to tell us? They're they're fairly short bills. If you haven't read them, um, they're they're very short um, and concise. But Patrick, do you want to talk to us a little bit about the difference? Um, there is a slight difference between 703 and 705. When I first saw the titles, I was confused. But when I read the bills, I realized what the difference was. So Patrick, do you want to summarize them for us? Yeah, the, um, the P3 bills are relatively short. Um, the 703 simply requires, uh, prohibits the adding of new lanes to I-270 or I-495 after October of this year. And 705 prohibits the addition of toll on the same roads. The one's about lanes and one's about tolls. Um, any questions or discussion? No, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. um, everyone knows where I stand on, on the issue of widening I-495 and, yes. and uh, 270 because that really is gonna affect my district. Um, I am concerned uh, as I believe it was Delegate Clark mentioned earlier about unintended consequences down the road, because I do think that there are places in I-270 that um, could benefit from widening. Um, so as we go through and discuss this, I want to make sure that we're not um, cutting off our nose to spite our face, so to speak. Yeah, my, my understanding is there is somewhat of a bottleneck somewhere along 270 uh, at this one specific part along 270. Yeah. Correct. And there's there's enough space up there right. where they deserve, need, could widen the highway. Um, 
just not down in my district. I'll just say that. <laughs> a lot of space there. Um, thank you. Any other questions about 703 or 705? 705 is the one that deals with toll lanes. No? Okay. Um, so 704, Patrick, do you want to talk to us about the Stop the Maglev Act of 2021? Yes. Um, well, the name kind of speaks for itself. Um, this bill just puts some restrictions on a maglev, um, prohibiting its construction within two miles of a protected property, which is defined in the bill um, as a lot where a residence is, a waterfront park, um, federal property, national park, or a forest preserve. Um, and then it prohibits um, locals, counties, and municipalities um, to approve construction or condemnation um, for um, maglev within two miles of protected property. Great. Any questions about this bill? I have a quick question. Sure. Um, so, for for Patrick or you know for whoever, I noticed in the last maglev bill it looked like it applied to essentially any project that uses that type of technology. In other words, the funding bill doesn't just prohibit state funding for this one project we're talking about um, in Maryland uh, right now, but it prohibits funding for any mag you know, any project ever that uses that specific technology. Like I think a state project or a, PP, a, a, a P3 or this specific private project, does this bill do the same thing? In other words, are the restrictions in this bill specific to this one maglev project we're talking about or any project that uses maglev technology? Well, any maglev project, but not it's more expansive than that. It's okay. defined, yeah, so um, the definition is magnetic levitation transportation system includes a facility or structure incident to the construction or operation of a magnetic levitation transportation system. Um, so it, yeah. yeah, any so perhaps put it another way, it wouldn't apply to Hyperloop. Right, it wouldn't apply to the Hyperloop. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. But like, for example, if the state of Maryland wanted to build a maglev project in three years with a new governor in Western Maryland, these two bills would prohibit that in the same way. Yes. Okay. And yeah. and and if new technology came along and it used to somewhat of the concept of the maglev, wouldn't it prohibit them too? If it fit the defined terms, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you know, it's dangerous, dangerous stuff. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have to, I think, perfect timing, it looks like. Um, it's 129. Yep. So, yeah, um, good discussion. Uh, feel, you know, my door is open figuratively. My door is actually shut, but you can call me or I'm happy to Zoom if you have any questions or thoughts about this bill. Uh, or any of the bills, I mean, before next week. And we will announce if it sounds like it's okay for folks to do before our ENT hearing. So I think that's what we're going to go with. So we can let you have early nights on Tuesday nights. Um, but we'll keep in touch and I'll see you all in 30 seconds on another Zoom.